Ready to level up your leadership? This is The Growth Project. Hi, folks. Welcome back to The Growth Project. My name is Jason, your host, and it's great to be back. It's been a few weeks since the last episode. I've had a lot of things juggling lately and uh, been very busy with my work. Work's been really flat out, and I think everyone I'm speaking to at the moment is the same. We're coming out of that winter that maybe we've had a bit of a lull and we're moving full steam ahead towards end of year, and that's... um, that's speeding things up a lot. And also I was lucky enough to guest appear on another podcast called Major Convos. So I'll put the episode in the show notes, make sure to check that out. Had a really fun chat with um, Matt and Corey over at, um, at Major Convos and they're a podcast which is focusing on um, business in the vet sector. So education, RTOs. So check that out. It was really fun. Those guys are doing some really cool stuff over there and they've got some really interesting guests as well. So make sure you check that out. And I am trying to organize to have the guys appear on the growth project as well. So keep your ears peeled for that one. So today I'm wanting to achieve a particular thing. Today I'm not focusing on tools and uh, techniques on any particular thing. What I'm talking about is I just want us to reframe conflict and to look at it from a different perspective through a different lens and start thinking about conflict in a different way. Because what we want to do is we want to see, we want to see conflict as an opportunity for growth, for learning and for collaboration. So we'll talk about what some of the benefits are of that. And even a couple of examples that we're probably uh, familiar with, or you might be familiar with. So uh, let's start with talking about the nature of conflict and what it is. So um, when we hear the word conflict, we tend to think of arguments and really tense situations. That's, I think, what what a lot of people's default perception of conflict is. And how can it manifest in the workplace? Well, in, in lots of ways, um, obviously, where we have uh, where we have different opinions, where we have different personality styles working together, where we have um, maybe a particular problem to solve, and maybe a few options on how to attack it, the process of finding our way forward, where there's a, where there's multiple different directions we could take. This is where we're engaging with conflict. And of course, we can have situations like the stereotypical ones. They can happen occur, but we do have conflict in our daily work lives and personal, but we're focusing more on on work at the moment. We do have conflict in our work environments more often than we realize. So what we want to do though is understand what, triggers conflict. That's the first thing. So uh, it could be misunderstandings. It could be that we're stretched for resources. It could be that we've got differing goals between team members or between us and a stakeholder or between you and another person. And these are prime situations where conflict will emerge. So what I find though is, is when we reframe conflict in our minds differently, it can influence how you engage with that conflict. Let's talk about why conflict is often seen as a really negative thing and why why that can influence how we engage with it. So the negative perception of conflict often is deeply rooted in, you know, I guess our social and, and organisational norms and there are a few reasons why we we have um, this perception and there are also some common misconceptions which we'll get to. But why? Why do we see it as negative? Well, many people grow up in environments where conflict is associated with negativity 
or instability or even sometimes in some cases danger. And this will generally put a, a general baseline or overlay on that person's perception of conflict and creates the understanding that conflict is something that we need to avoid. Um, it is often equated with hostility or aggression. That, that I think that comes to mind for a lot of people when we start talking about conflict. So people might think that um, when we do have a conflict that someone has to be right and someone has to be wrong and there's that creates a win-lose mentality. And sometimes we win but sometimes we lose or we come out of situations feeling like that. So people then fear that if the conflict isn't managed properly, they'll lose or it could escalate to a more severe problem and potentially even uh, leading to legal issues and other serious consequences, especially in the workplace as well. But in a business setting, conflict is often seen also as a hindrance to productivity. Teams will uh, that engage in conflict might be perceived as being less effective even though we know that constructive conflict can lead to better outcomes and better decision-making if harnessed well. There is a common belief too that um, that conflict with peers or your leaders or superiors in the workplace might lead to negative impressions or eva- negative evaluations on performance or even job loss and that causes a lot of people to avoid conflict at all costs. And when we avoid the conflicts, that means we're not dealing with problems or we're not dealing with issues or we're not capitalising on opportunities for improvement and growth. And then there's also just the, the basic fact that it can be emotionally taxing. It can be really difficult. It can be heavy to deal with. It can lead to stress. It can lead to burnout. And we've spoken before on previous episodes about why those things are problematic so all of these things, I think, and there, are, there would be lots more, but they, those are just my brief thoughts on why uh, conflict is seen almost entirely as a negative. So, uh, but there are also some misconceptions about conflict as well. So there is the misconception that conflict equals failure and uh, that the presence of conflict signifies that there's been a failure in leadership or failure in teamwork when in fact it's just a natural part of human interaction and it's a natural part of workplaces as well. I've never been in a workplace where it's been free of conflict. And when I say that, I'm opening my mind to the to the wider spectrum of conflict, not just the tense situations. I'm talking about um, I'm talking about innovation and the process of going through that conflict to lead to innovations and, and, and collaborating with people when we have a problem to solve. There is a misconception that avoiding an, an issue that needs to be confronted, which would create a conflict situation, that avoiding it means that we have peace, where the reality is that it can exacerbate underlying issues and not deal with problems that need to be dealt with. There's also a false belief that there's a single solution to every conflict where in reality different conflicts require different resolution approaches and understanding these different perspectives and understanding the misconceptions around conflict allows us to reframe how we see it, which then informs and influences how we engage with it. Instead of viewing it as something negative that has to be avoided, we can see it as an opportunity for growth and collaboration and building resilience, uh, personal resilience, and ultimately it can contribute to um, resilience of a team and ultimately a business. So we do, when we start talking about resilience, I'm going to mention it a few times. Uh, I am aiming to talk to a person who, from my work past, who I consider to be an expert in the space of resilience. So keep an an ear out for that one. I'm not going down that path today. I'm talking about resilience in, um, in more of an, uh, I guess more of an individual sense, 
but or we are going to focus on another episode on um, resilience in business and I guess also more from a systematic point of view as well. That's not the angle we're looking at today. So the first thing we need to do is to change our perspective on conflict. So there are definite benefits from reframing that conflict, as I've mentioned earlier. There, there are some really famous examples too that I might point out. So examples where conflict was seen as an opportunity and collaboration led to growth and better outcomes. And I think from an individual example, one of the uh, really famous ones that a lot of people would be aware of, I think, would be Steve Jobs. Now, we all know who Steve Jobs is, the founder of Apple or the co-founder of Apple. And what happened in... um, in I think it was 1985 or somewhere in the mid 80s, he was ousted from Apple, the the company that he co-founded. After there were significant conflicts with the board and their CEO at the time, John Scully, and this was a significant personal and professional conflict, and he was ousted, and the this experience really could have easily led Steve Jobs to hold grudges and just live in resentment for a long time or forever um, or or abandon his ambitions in the tech world and all those sorts of things. But after he left Apple, he founded Next or NEXT. Uh, He And this is a computer platform development company uh, that was ultimately acquired back by Apple in 1996. And this acquisition led to Jobs returning to Apple and at this point, this is where he revived the company. It was at the brink of of, um, of bankruptcy. And despite the past conflicts and the bad blood and all, the, all of those, those issues from the past, they were put to the side. And even some of the people who were involved in having him ousted from the company were still there. He collaborated um, with these people and he brought Apple back from the brink of bankruptcy. And we all know where they are today. It's incredible what that mindset did. He didn't dwell in the conflict. He chose to see the opportunity that was presented to him when that unfolded at the time. So while he was away from Apple, he honed his skills in technology and in particular in leadership, and he's, he's made a lot of public comments about this um, in, in, around the leadership in particular, uh, which equipped him with, I guess, a unique set of tools that he used to transform Apple into one of the most successful successful companies of all time globally. So this really showcased his ability to overcome the previous conflicts and collaborate with Apple again. And that demonstrated a lot of immense personal resilience, especially given the fact that all of that was happening in the public domain. So he's returned to Apple though. And the innovations that followed, like the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad and all the things that we see now, came was a direct result of, of the ability for all parties involved, Steve Jobs and the other people involved, to put the previous conflicts aside and collaborate. So that for me is one of the more famous ones that, that I could think of about from an individual perspective. But if we look at it from an organisational perspective, perspective as well. There is another example involving Apple and uh, this was Apple and IBM. So this is one of the most famous examples of transforming conflict into collaboration. There uh, is the partnership between Apple and IBM. So these two companies were once arch rivals and this was during the computer, the personal computer revolution in the 80s and the 90s. But in 2014, they announced a partnership that was aimed at transforming enterprise mobility through a new class of business apps. And this brought IBM's big data and analytics capabilities to the iPhone and the iPad. So the partnership really brought together uh, and, and allowed these two companies to thrive in the areas that they were each weaker. And therefore, both of those business and now much more resilient to market changes as a result of that collaboration. So the lessons from those examples, um, when it comes to 
the uh, the organizational example. So both companies were arch rivals, but they set aside their differences to collaborate because they saw opportunities in that partnership and exploring it. So um, sometimes it's better to join forces with competitors or the other side if it serves a, a if it, if if we can see a bigger picture. If there's a larger mutual interest, uh, it also shows that. Um, IBM's expertise in data analytics and enterprise solutions really meshed well with Apple's consumer-focused hardware and software. And by recognizing what each party excelled in, they were able to create a much more robust and resilient partnership. Both of those companies had been facing their own challenges, adapting to a really rapidly evolving tech landscape. Their collaboration serves uh, as a as an example or a model of how adapting to market demands often involves strategic partnerships and we they might not have ever been thinkable in the past the uh, the collaboration made both companies much more resilient by broadening their tech uh, sorry their their reach and their capabilities when companies or organizations with different strengths collaborate it often results in a more resilient entity capable of weathering various challenges. Both Apple and IBM are giants in their respective fields, so they had to trust each other for a successful partnership. And this teaches us, though, that building and and maintaining a good reputation can open doors for future collaborations, even with past competitors or where there may have been conflict in the past So by applying lessons like this, um, both individuals and organizations can learn how to transform conflict or competition into beneficial collaborations, ultimately creating more resilient systems and relationships. So um, I think the benefits of turning conflict into collaboration are fairly obvious for most people, um, but definitely increases employee engagement because conversations are leading to positive outcomes. And when we see those results, it's really energizing. Um, and what that tends to do is is foster um, more creativity and innovation in the way that people are thinking and, and talking with each other and the ideas that are being brought to the table. And when we start seeing stronger relationships being built, um, this can help t- strengthen team bonds and then we start to see team members supporting each other and supporting other functions and um, getting behind ideas and that's really what we want. So I guess for me, I, th- I feel that there are five key steps for taking a conflict situation and turning it around into a collaboration to start reaping benefits and I think that the first step is to acknowledge that there is a conflict and be, be aware that there is a conflict, then I think what you need to do is take time to understand the, the different perspective from the, other, from the other side of the conflict. And we've spoken in other episodes about active listening and some of the other skills and techniques around uh, keeping your cool during conflict and things like this and asking empathetic questions to better understand what the issues are on the other side. If we can understand the different perspectives, what that gives us the opportunity to do is to find a common ground. For for me, if I'm in a conflict situation, one of the first things I'm trying to do, uh, I'm trying to get to a place where I can understand and see the potential for a common ground. And once we can point out a common ground to the other person or the other side or the other stakeholder, um, that's where we can start inviting them to collaborate and then which leads to the fourth step, which is to then work on solutions together, co-developing solutions. And once we have those solutions designed or decided or agreed, we can then step five, implement and reflect on that solution and uh, and I guess monitor to hopefully by that stage reap some benefits. So the the process of collaborating 
Um, I want to talk about how I believe it builds resilience, firstly, from a personal perspective and an individual perspective. And the first is around emotional intelligence. So when you successfully navigate through conflict often, that means you've had to employ some uh, some emotional intelligence. You've had to apply some evolved skills, um, including self-awareness and empathy, and uh, while still staying solution-focused. So the more you do that, um, the you continuously improve your emotional intelligence, and that has flow-on effects and benefits in all parts of your life when we start seeing that happen. Um, but it also just means that we become much more adept at navigating any future conflicts that might arise. I do believe that it, it really rapidly enhances a person's problem-solving skills. Every time we have a conflict situation, this is a unique or, the, or where there's a unique problem that requires a solution, uh, the, the more time we, we work through that, the better we become at problem-solving. And this is a skill that contributes to personal resilience directly. Enhanced self-confidence. I don't think this can be under understated and the impact and importance of that. So when we successfully resolve conflicts that will boost our self-confidence, we gain a sense of, of mastery over difficult situations and that can then help us go into future conflicts with a much healthier mindset, much more ready much more capable and that ultimately leads to us being much more adaptable. So when we have tricky situations or, or stressful periods of time, we're able to respond to those really productively and find solutions quickly, find common grounds during conflict a lot faster. Um, then I think that there's, there's some organizational re- resilience, uh, that comes out of collaboration as well. So um, there's no doubt that that it enhances and really highlights innovation and creativity. So what we're trying to do when we collaborate is get a win-win situation as opposed to just compromising. So I don't see compromising and collaborating as the same. Sometimes I think, uh, I think um, compromising is – really helpful where we might have a situation where we need a fast solution. We don't have the luxury of time to collaborate. We need a solution fast or at least for the interim. Um, but when we have a, when we have a, a uh, situation where we're compromising, what's happening is that either one or both parties aren't getting all of what they need. They're, we're getting partially our needs met. Uh, but the only way for both sides to have all of their needs met during conflict, I believe, is is by collaboration. So this creates a much stronger team dynamic, whether it's a team or whether it's a re- relationship between you and a stakeholder. When we successfully navigate conflicts, this can build trust. I've spoken so much about building trust. You're probably sick of hearing me say the word. Uh, but it also will strengthen relationships among team members and between yourself and other stakeholders as well. So this collaborative environment is far more resilient to adverse situations uh, because team members are more likely to support each other during challenging times and start trying to focus on that common ground and workable solutions. It no doubt improves communication. So, it, because it requires open and honest communication to occur to collaborate effectively. When we do have a well-managed conflict, it does set a precedent for transparent communication throughout your team, throughout the business, between you and stakeholders. And what that does, though, is that normalizes that that kind of behavior and those attitudes towards resolving conflict it can also optimize resource allocation as well. So sometimes conflicts might arise because of resource limits. So where we find resolutions, this can lead to more efficient uh, resource allocation and make the business more agile and better equipped to handle future challenges as well. And I think that, that all of this gives a strategic advantage to any business. This can turn internal 
and external conflicts into opportunities. And this is where I think a business gains a competitive edge, whether it's resolving conflicts with stakeholders or conflicts between team members, having the ability to navigate challenges effectively is really a mark of a resilient business. So in conclusion, conflict in the workplace is often seen uh, negatively, triggered by misunderstandings um, or resourcing issues or divergent goals um, or inappropriate behaviours. However, if we change our perspective on conflict, this can open doors for resilience and growth and innovation. And the key here is having the tools and the skills to transfer, transform conflict into, con- into collaboration through those steps of acknowledging the issue, understanding different viewpoints, finding common ground and co-creating solutions. So this, apo- this approach not only builds resilience, but it also enhances employee engagement, their creativity and teamwork. And the example like Steve Jobs' return to Apple and the Apple to IBM partnership really illustrates how individuals and organisations can benefit from simply reframing the perception of conflict and how to approach it. So the overarching lesson is that setting aside past rivalries and conflicts, leveraging strengths, collaboration and adapting to change can drive innovation and resilience. So there's my thoughts on all of that. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I do also just want to take the time to thank people who have sent me messages and emails. I've really enjoyed those interactions and I really appreciate the encouragement and the feedback. And I might just ask a favour too, if you're enjoying the show, please, I'd really appreciate it if you could give a five-star rating on whatever platform you're listening to and share it with someone, just even just one person. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, Until the next time though, stay well, look after yourself, look after your teams, and I'll speak to you on the next one. There you have it, folks. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of The Growth Project. I'm really enjoying the interaction, so please keep the messages and emails coming through. Keep an eye out for our upcoming Frontline Leader Mindset workshops at enatrain.com.au. They're in Sydney and Melbourne, and of course, you can reach out to request a private customised workshop for your team. Again, that's enatrain.com.au. That's E N E R. T-R-A-I-N dot com dot A-U. What would really help us send our leadership insights far and wide is five-star ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or even just share the show with your network, family, and friends. Until the next episode, look after yourself and look after your teams. <laughs>